up in Albany, Georgia. I was born in uh, November the 8th, 1963. 59 years ago. Mm -hmm. Coming up on 59 this year. Um, the music wasn't that sophisticated. Um, in fact, we didn't even have any... The only instruments that we had in, in, in the church that I grew up in early on was... The, 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 uh, I remember seeing someone play the drums and then there was an old lady who, do you, you, do you know what a washboard is? Sure, washboard. yeah. She used to play a washboard. She had a washboard and a coat hanger. <laughs> a real primitive, homemade instrument. And she would take this coat hanger and she'd beat out these rhythms on the washboard. And would be really grooving and swinging. And then there was, a, um, I remember seeing a person playing a pot with a wooden spoon, you know, and you had all of this rhythm and people singing. You would get a group of those old ladies who would sing these, uh, these spirituals and it would be so moving. You'd see deacons, these big burly deacons, they'd be moved to tears. Huh. You know, hearing these old ladies sing these songs, and even at the age of, and I'm, I'm I'm like three and four years old at the time, and even at that age, I was aware of the various emotions and reactions that you could get from people through through uh, from from playing music, and I was aware of that at that young tender age. Yeah, and it was fascinating, and. Um, Later on, the guitar was incorporated into the uh, into the services. I remember the first time I saw the guitar, I came to church one Sunday, and I see this object perched up against one of the pews. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's, an, that's a weird looking device, whatever it is. And I looked at it, and upon close closer examination, I saw this cable, which was coming out of this hole it extended from the hole in the instrument to this box uh, and the other end of the cable was in another hole mm -hmm. it, it was plugged into another hole on this box and I found out later on that that was the amplifier so I said hmm, hmm. so this gentleman started to play it and I still remember his name uh, Deacon Johnny Will Williams I never met Johnny Will Williams but I knew who he was I remember hearing my mom and some of the other people in the church refer to him. Oh, man, Johnny Will's going to play that guitar. Oh, we're going to have a good time tonight. <laughs> you know? So we would, he picked up this instrument and he played it. He, he, he made him, uh, he strummed it. And immediately I was like, I got this feeling. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow. And I knew that whatever uh, feelings that I had inside musically, that would be the tool that I would be using to express myself. That's so cool. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the first time I saw the guitar. It was in, in, the, in the church. And uh, so my mom um, noticed that every time we'd um, go to church, I would always end up in the corner watching this gentleman play the guitar, or whoever else. Because there were a few other guitar players in the church, too. There was uh, Brother Butch Claude, Harry Coleman, uh, Predest Wright, who I'm still in touch with. I'm still in touch with some of these people. Wow. And uh, I'd f and Sister Ida Mae Baker. I can't leave her out because she's the one who told me, who showed me how to tune a guitar. Okay. Sister Ida Mae Baker. I'm still in touch with her too. And did you tune the guitar regular? That, okay. Yeah. I want to get to that okay, in a second. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'd end up in the corner watching these people play the guitar. Uh, so my mother, she's paying attention to me. She's she's watching all of these all of this stuff go down. So one day, she uh, came home from the from the store. She comes into the house with a bag of stuff, and you know how it is when you're a little when you were a little kid. Whenever your parents came home with a bag of anything from the store, you want to know, well, hey, what's for me? <laughs> and so I followed her into the kitchen. I said, Mama, did you get me anything? So she reached into the bag and pulled out this guitar. That's awesome. It was a green guitar, plastic, with red strings on it. And it was one of the ugliest shades of green you, ever, <laughs> you can ever imagine. But 
it was something that I wanted, something that I'd been desiring for a while. And so she gave it to me, and I didn't tune it or anything. I just, you know, held it like this and started to mimic. I was mimicking what I'd seen in church. You know, they, they held it like this and they strummed it. So I strummed it, and I'll never forget feeling the vibrations from that instrument go through my body. Mm. And to this day, you know, man, I still get that same feeling, you know, when I play, uh, when I play the guitar. So, um... I would be around the house banging on this thing, on this guitar, and I must have drove my mom and dad crazy. Right. <laughs> but they didn't say stop. They didn't, they, did, they, didn't, they didn't discourage me. And so I ended up um, playing in the church a couple of years after that. Uh, and I'm back to, uh, we were talking about the tuning. Yeah. The lady, um, Sister Ida Mae Baker, showed me how to tune the guitar. She... It wasn't the regular Spanish tuning. It was an open E uh, tuning. Right. Yeah. Back then, and I don't know if you've ever heard this phrase before, this term before, but they used to call it playing in Vasapu. You never heard, heard I know, that. I know, I know, I know <laughs> you never heard that before. Yeah, but it's, they call it Vasapu when you know playing in the open the open E tuning. Okay, I've heard you do that. Like yeah. backstage, you yeah, tune you know, the guitar like that. It showed some of the early songs. Some that you, of that old stuff that we used to play in the church years ago. Um, and then uh, I got good enough to where I could play in the church. And then one of the other guys showed me um, the Spanish, the regular, the regular Spanish tuning. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, he, you know, I learned a few chords just from listening and watching people play, and then listening to some of the records. My mother had a lot of gospel records. Um, you ever hear of a group called the Dixie Hummingbirds? Yeah. Yeah, she had records by the Dixie Hummingbirds. In fact, uh, the first solo that I ever copied was from one of their records, uh, a tune called Standing by the Bedside of My Neighbor. And I actually met the guy, the original guitarist. You've heard, you, you've heard, you've heard the group. Of yeah, the group. it's like, what is it, four singers and a guitarist? Or yes, yeah. exactly right. Yeah. And uh, Howard Carroll, who just died a couple of years ago, but I actually met, I met him. I had, because uh, I always wanted to meet that guy, man. And I found out that he was in a nursing home in Philadelphia. Okay. So, I just, you know, when I found that out, I found that out that day and that uh, later on that afternoon, I got in my car and drove to see him. I said, you know, if he curses me out or they, if I get thrown out, so be it. I cannot pass up this opportunity to meet this guy. That's really cool. So, I drove to Philadelphia and uh, I got in without a hitch. I took my guitar, took my little uh, amplifier and I... Uh, found out which room he was in and so I went to his room and there was this frail old man sitting in a wheelchair wow you know so I um, I walked in and I told him who I was and hey, I'm a guitar player I grew up listening to you and it's just such an honor to be with you and to meet you so I took out my guitar plugged it in and the first thing I played was a uh, a tune by God, uh, by James Cleveland called God Has Smiled on Me. Mm. And that old man sat down in that chair and just cried. Oh, man, that's awesome. He cried, <laughs> and then I uh, played a few other hymns for him. What a friend we have in Jesus. Just, you know. And then I started playing uh, that solo that I picked up. Right, right. <laughs> he, his face lit up like a, <laughs> like a Christmas tree, man. That's super cool. Yeah, Howard Carroll, but I went back to see him again a couple of times after that first, after our initial meeting. And uh, in fact, the second time I went back, back to see him, he said, Malone, good to see you again. And he t reminded me of, uh, of, of that song that I played with him, God Has Smiled On Me. He mm -hmm. said, man, play that too for me again. He said, that really stayed with me when you played it the first time. Oh, man. Yeah, so, but, uh, you know, inspirations, it's good to have them. Yeah, I know. It's yeah. good to have him, man. I talked to one of my inspirations this morning, Mr. Ron Carter. I know you. I know he means a lot to you. Yes. Yeah, I went by. The, I I called him up just to just just to check up on him, see how he was doing. I like to call people and check up on him. Yeah, I know you. Especially do now. Yeah. Because you know we're in this pandemic and we've lost a lot of people, and uh, we don't see each other out as regularly yes. as we as we used to because everybody's trying not to get sick. Yeah. And trying to stay safe and, you know, be socially distant. So 
it's more important than ever now to just pick up the phone and check in with people, see how they're doing. Yeah, you've always been good about that, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, let me ask you about Ron Carter. Um, well, you you worked so much with him and with Ray Brown, two I've been of the spoiled. greatest bass players of all time. I've two been of my spoiled. Heroes. That's exactly right. I've been spoiled when it comes to uh, bass players, man. You know, Ron Carter, um, Ray Brown, of course, uh, Milt Hinton, who I got to yeah. sp- spend some time with. I wish you could have met those old timers, man. Me too. I'm glad I know Mr. I'm Carter. I'm glad you though. met Mr. Carter. That's good for you. But, you know, Ray Brown and Milt Hinton, just just guys from that generation. Yeah. It's, uh, they they have a different spin on things. Yeah. <laughs> you know that. Can you, I mean, can you elaborate on, you know, they're so different. What what do they have? What have Ray Ron Brown? and Ray Brown? Yeah. You know something I'm going to tell you about that, Luke? They are different, but there's more common ground there than people may realize. Okay. And I'll tell you why I say that. It's because um, when you hear those two gentlemen play, the groove, the time, and the quarter note, it's not an afterthought. That's the most important thing. You know, finding the, like Ron Cott always says, finding the right notes. Mm -hmm. When you hear those two men play that instrument, um, there's no randomness. Everything that they play makes sense, makes yeah. musical sense. And it has uh, every note, every phrase has a place and a purpose. Yeah. And they understand the piano. Yeah. That's why I hired you to play because we made some records together and did a lot of playing together. You understand the piano and you don't play any dumb notes, any <laughs> notes that shouldn't be there. It all makes sense. And you know, I mean, when I look for a bass player, when I hire a bass player, that's what I look for. Mm. First of all, being able to get good sound, a good sound. See, Ron Carter and Ray Brown, they have great sounds on the instruments. Yeah. And um, they play the bass. Yeah. I've played with bass players in the past who have all of this technique and skill, and they want to be guitar players or horn players. And that has its place, but when it, but when it comes time to lay down the groove and provide that comfort and uh, make the rhythm section feel good. That's what I look for. They don't, yeah. a, lot of the, a lot of them aren't, aren't always able to do that. And I'm like, well, damn, man, we already got a guitar player in the right. band. You stay in your lane, I'll stay in my lane. Yeah. <laughs> and let's just make some music. And it's very easy to do that with players of the caliber of yourself, Ron Carter, Ray Brown, Christian McBride, Peter Washington, mm-hmm. uh, Vince DuPont. They all, you know, David Wong. Those yeah. guys, they get it, man. Well, you would always they th- get it. Yeah, you always would let me know if I was playing some dumb notes too. Which, <laughs> you didn't you have know. to do. You didn't do that too much, though. You always played great. But I did appreciate that. It was the basically between you and Johnny O'Neill? That was my on the bandstand musical education. So I always appreciated that you let me learn on the spot and well, that's let the me way, know. In that's the, the way I learned, you know. Luke. That's the way I learned. I know, but I, I don't think people necessarily learn that way now yeah as well, much as your generation like who i mean when who did you learn from in that capacity like on the on, on the, the job, job? yeah who was oh, they're gonna feel guys oh, then there's some of them a lot of them aren't famous mm. you know a lot of times um some of the best musical education that one can get is from people in your hometown mm-hmm. uh, before we moved to New York and started to make names for ourselves there were people in I'm sure that there were people in Winnipeg that you got for a sure. lot of uh, yeah. valuable insight and information from uh, there was a guy my first band leader well the first the, f- the first experience was in the church you know that's where I really learned how to 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 to, to communicate with the, with the audience I wanted to ask you about that too. And, you know, because my my pastor, he's gone now. My my ex pastor, he's he's gone now. But he was didn't he didn't know much about didn't didn't know anything about music. But he had a really good, a really good instinct for what could work. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, if we weren't, if we were getting too self indulgent, playing in the church, you know, we'd be getting into ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Not really. Uh, Focusing on the message, the message, and, and communicating with the with the audience, 
he would always he he'd be sitting down in his chair. You know how the pastors have those chairs in the yeah, pulpit. Yeah. He's sitting in his be sitting in his chair, and we'd be over here and we'd be doing our thing. And if it wasn't happening, he'd look over in your direction. He wouldn't say anything, but you know he'd just give you that look. <laughs> And then, uh, if you didn't get it, then he would stand up to uh, behind the the the, uh, the podium or the rostrum, whatever you call yeah, those yeah. things. And he's he said, "All right, you guys, stay in the spirit." He, that was his biggest thing. Stay you know, in the spirit. Stay in the spirit. Mm. That that meant don't get too self indulgent. Yeah, yeah. Stay in the spirit. Stay in the spirit. And later on, I meant that I, I took that to mean don't forget that it's not just about you. Yeah. You, you're playing for these people out here. You know, yeah. you got to, you know, give them something to go home feeling good about. Stay in the spirit. Yeah. And then if you didn't get it, he would make you take your instruments off, put down the guitar, or get up from the drums or from the piano, get on the altar and pray for forgiveness. Really? <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Did you have to do that ever? Uh, yeah, do it a couple of times. <laughs> I had to do it a couple of times, but that was, you know, but that was some, it was some good training. You That's know? awesome. Yeah. You, had to, you, you, you cannot forget about the listener. I mean, I feel like that happens so often in mm-hmm. jazz, yeah. you know? You can't forget about the listener, man. God, I always appreciated that about you, like playing for regular people, you know, around the country or in different places. Mm hmm. Well, but that's, you know, those are the ones who, uh, I mean, it's nice to, to have the, the approval and the respect of the musicians, but let's face it: a lot of musicians they don't. If you had, to, if you if you depended on their support, you'd be poor as a church mouse, man. Because they don't. A lot yeah. of them don't. They don't buy your recordings. Yeah. They don't want to spend money to come to hear you play. Everybody's so busy trying to get on the guest list. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. You know what I'm talking about. I hear you. So you know, uh, yeah, that's one of the things I learned from being in the, you know, playing in church. And then you asked me about. Uh, on the job training with musicians. I yeah. learned uh, so much from, um, like I was saying earlier, about musicians who aren't famous, who are in your hometown. Yeah. But they, I mean, like uh, growing up in Albany, Georgia, uh, my first band leader, his name was Al Rylander. He's the one who got me out of Albany, Georgia. Uh, I met Al when I was about 16, 17 years old, and I used to go to the this place called the House of Jazz, and I sit in with him. I sit with another guy named Orlando Smith, Dr. T. Marshall Jones, Dr. Lamar Smith, who are two people who taught over at the local college. Mm-hmm. But they used to run these jam sessions. So, you know, th- these these people were so helpful for me, man. In fact, my that other guy that I mentioned, Al Riley, the organ player, he dropped something on me when I was about maybe 17, 18 years old. Because back then I was a speed demon, you know. I, I, was, mm-hmm. I had all this. I was fast. I was so fast I could, well, I could handcuff lightning. <laughs> anyway, he told me one day we were on the gig, and he looked at me. He said, "Son, you got to be very careful about playing a whole lot of shit, mm-hmm. because after a while, that's all it is—just a whole lot of shit." <laughs> I never forgot that. <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, being on the road with Jimmy Smith, I learned a lot from Jimmy. Mm-hmm. Um, learned a lot of... T- Freddie Cole. You, yeah. wrote, you worked with Freddie, didn't you? I never did, yeah. Yeah, Freddie. Ooh, yeah. boy, that was a great education, man. Yeah, that was... He was cheap as hell <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> Freddie would take a dollar. <laughs> I'm not... I, I mean, it was funny, because we just joke <laughs> about it. But Freddie would take a dollar and squeeze that bad boy until George Washington turned into Booker T. Washington. <laughs> but I love him, though, man. He was great. Yeah, but so I've been very fortunate, man. Uh, and then something else, Luke, just playing various types of music because, I mean, as much as I love jazz, I was never one of those guys who was a, what you call, what you would call a purist. A purist. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love it, but I like other kinds of music too, man. Uh, and I just never could understand musicians who would turn up their noses or look down their noses at other types of music. Yeah. And I'm talking specifically jazz musicians. Right. Um, well, every, like everybody knows that you're, you know, that you know that Benson or West Montgomery are big influences. Like outside of the jazz world, who are your top guitar influences? Was, well, you know, George Benson, of course. Cause, but see, the thing about West and George, the thing that was so that's so cool about both of those guys is that yeah. you're not going to play any... Uh, you're gonna you're not gonna play jazz guitar or find 
anybody who plays jazz guitar any better than those guys. Of course. But the thing that was so hip about that's so hip about both of those people is that they uh, they could play anything. They could take a pop tune, play, take anything, and make music out of it. Absolutely, yeah. You know, you know, you just 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 make make music. Grant Green, uh, you know, they could play anything, and they and they and they had had an appreciation for the blues. Uh, melodies, yeah. good pretty melodies. See, you can take a pretty melody. The pretty melodies all over the place, uh, and I might get some flack for saying this, but Kenny G, say what you say, say what you want to say about him. Cat's playing melodic music. Mm-hmm. He's playing melodies, and I, you know, I mean, I make jokes about Kenny G. There are a lot of <laughs> jokes about him, like that joke. You hear the joke about Kenny G doing a Monk record? No. You, yeah, round about noon, the straight no changes. Oh. It's funny, <laughs> but I don't hate Kenny G as a musician, right? Because he's making people happy. And uh, I I met him one time. He's a nice he's a nice guy. Right. You know. But the thing about this about any kind of music, you got to make people happy. I mean, you Amen. just can't you just can't uh, become so insular and self indulgent until you forget about the people. Totally. About the about the about the milkman, the mailman, right. the, uh, the person who drives your clo- cl- totally. dry cleans your clothes. Totally. Yeah. So you know, I I, uh, I, I and plus people in other genre, gen- genres of music. I'm talking musicians here. They are j- just as serious about what they're doing as a jazz player. Yes. You know, and I know a lot of jazz musicians. If you take them away from their thing and put them in a situation where they got to play uh, just a groove. Totally. Or a backbeat. Or totally. play simple. They can't yeah. do it because their virtuosity and their egos will not allow them to do that. Mm-hmm see you know so <laughs> plus and some I, of that music's a lot harder than jazz musicians give it the, credit the to be simple sometimes yeah. plus simplicity is the hardest thing someone can achieve I heard somebody say that one time and that that quote really resonated with me mm-hmm. yeah so you know and I tell young people today you know play it all because that's the old that's what the old timers told me yeah play it all and as rhythm section players we know how important it is to be versatile and to just play what the music calls for. You know, if you want a funk gig or whatever gig, play that gig. Yeah. Yeah, yeah just just do, uh, like Art Blakey used to say, let the punishment fit the crime. I hear you. Mm-hmm. But I'm still interested, like, other than guitar players that everybody would... Oh, I'm sorry. I know that you, yeah. you know, have learned from, like, who are some people that... Uh, you mean we, in other other styles of music? Yeah, that we might not know so much about that, oh, yeah, that you oh. got stuff from or that Johnny you, Guitar Watson. Mm, you know that name? Yeah, for sure. We listened to him in the car one time. We, we listened to all yeah, we listened to all kinds of stuff. We'd yeah. be traveling on the road. And, we listened to a lot of Barry White in the car too. Yeah, I love Barry White. <laughs> Woo. You know you know who played on a lot of those records? Who's that? Lee Rittenauer. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah, I, I, and he told me something really interesting, man. He told me that um, I was asking him because I said, "Man, I read on the credits that you you own a lot of those Barry you own a lot of those Barry White, White records." What was that like, man? Because Barry wasn't uh, a trained, a scholastically trained musician, right? But he had this gift for hearing things and just putting things together. Yeah. And Lee told me that uh, Barry would have sometimes he would have like uh, three and four guitar players on those sessions, and he would go to each one and he would sing their parts to them. Just sing their parts to them, and it would work. Yeah, you know, so I have a lot of respect That's for awesome, Barry yeah. White. I love Barry White. I'm a huge Barry White fan. But I also have a lot of respect for people like Lee Rittenauer and a few other ones who can go into situations like that and just get the job done. Yeah. Like Paul Jackson Jr., you know yeah. that name? Yeah. He's on those Michael, some of those Michael Jackson records. Good friend of mine. He's right. on a lot of those Michael Jackson records. Uh Danny Kuchmar, you know that name? Not really. Great rhythm tech, rhythm player, man. Okay. Danny Kuchmar, um, Al McKee, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Yeah. You know, uh, Nile Rogers. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of great players out there, man. Yeah. And then uh, the 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 uh, the country players like Chet Atkins, who's a big influence on me. Mm-hmm. Love Chet Atkins. Uh, another one of those guys who you know can play anything. Yeah. You know, uh, Merle Travis. Um, lots of good players, man. There's a guy who lives in Boston, um, named Jeff Lockhart. 
You know that name? Um, yeah, Richie Goods turned me on him years ago. I don't ago. really know yeah, him. No, I mean, a great funk player, man. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Cornell Dupree? Of course. You know, you know that name? Of course. Um, who else? There's so many other good ones, man. And then there are um, other players. Um, some great fingerstyle players. I used to see this guy on TV a lot when I was a kid. And nobody talks about him now, but he was a wonderful, man. 12-string player named Leo Kotke. Okay. Yeah, yeah I don't know gotcha. him. <laughs> Yeah, those who are listening to this interview, uh, guitar players who are a little older and who are um, fans of the guitar, they might know who that is. Yeah. yeah but Leo Kotke, a uh, guy who lives up in Maine named Guy Van Duzer. Okay. Yeah, see, there's some players out there, man, that are really, um, really have really made an impact on the music. Ralph Towner, another yeah, one. You yeah. know that name? Yeah. Yeah, I got to see him uh, a few years ago. He was playing at the Jazz Standard. And I went to go see him, and uh, I think that might he might be the closest thing to Bill Evans on the guitar I've ever yeah, heard. Man. That's cool. Yeah, uh, uh, Le- uh, uh, Lenny Bro. Yeah, Canadian. Yeah, 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 that's right. That's one of your one of your, one of your homies. Yeah, <laughs> I think he lived in. Uh, I think he lived in Winnipeg. Yes, for a he while. did. Yeah, I some of my mm-hmm. early guys that I hung out with. Uh, yeah, so knew him. yeah, so I keep my ear to the ground, man. BB King, I can't leave him out. Well, you played with BB King. Yeah, I did a recording with him. What I was sure that did, like? Man. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> was that you intimidating? Know, is that intimidating well, for you to you do know, that? Or it was. It... it was. Uh, it, I still can't believe it happened. You know, yeah. In the twenty, we, we recorded in nineteen ninety nine. Twenty three years later, I still can't believe that that happened. That's so cool. It, yeah, but I'd met him in Florida back in the early nineties when I would first gotten signed to uh, Columbia Records. Mm-hmm. And we were doing the Sunfest down in Florida. And my band played, and B.B. Uh, King played later on that night, but I hung around because I, I, wanted, I wanted to of meet course, this guy. Yeah. Man, because I remember seeing him on TV when I was a kid, man, and just, you know, the way he played and sang was so, it really resonated me, with me because it was very similar to the music that I'd heard in church. Mm-hmm. So uh, I had to meet him, so I hung around all day uh, after my concert, just to meet BB King, and you know the, th- the thing that uh, resonated with me about him was that he was such a nice person because he had played a two-hour concert and uh, hung around for another hour and a half and signed autographs. That's cool. And that just I thought that was so so cool, man. Yeah. And then uh, I got to meet him and talk with him. And then, fast forward, almost 10 years later, I end up in the studio with him. Um, this guy named Stu Levine, who was producing a lot of BB's records at the time, got in touch with Tommy LaPuma, who was producing my records. I was signed with uh, Verb Records at the time. Yeah. So Tommy uh, called me up and said that Stu wants you to be involved in B.B. King's record. He's doing a, um, a recording of Lewis Jordan music. Um, and the record came out uh, that year, and it was called Let the Good Times Roll. Mm. And uh, on the recording was John Hurt. Remember John Hurt? Mm-hmm. He just died recently. Great bassist. Okay. John Hurt, Dr. John was on the date. The late, great Marcus Belgrave. Mm-hmm. The late, great uh, Hank Crawford. Right. And the late, great David Fathead Newman. Okay, wow, yeah. And Earl Palmer. You know that name? Yes. Ooh, boy, what a drummer, man. What <laughs> a drummer. What a pocket. That's awesome. But, uh, and, uh, B.B. King and I hit it off, man. We, uh, I, I got several pictures from that date. And he liked the fact, okay, all he wanted me to do was go, go in there and just play Freddie Green rhythm. Yeah. <laughs> play time. Which is something that I can, that I can do. Yeah, you definitely can. And I was can. very happy to give it to him. Oh, that's cool. However way he wanted it, man. <laughs> so that was so great, man. Uh, yeah, I got to play with B.B. King. Yeah, he was a beautiful guy, man. Beautiful cat. Funny, too. Great sense of humor. Yeah. That's cool. I feel like Jimmy Smith was is, is he one of the like the biggest characters that you ever worked with? Well, there are lots of uh, I've <laughs> I want to hear been like been around a few who characters. Are some of the well, some of that stuff I can't tell in public. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, I know. yeah. <laughs> but uh, he was a funny guy. But he, you know, Jimmy was interesting man because as crazy as he was, he was he was a very giving human being, mm-hmm. very 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 nice person when he wanted to be. I've seen that dark side too, where he can be right. really ornery. Uh, there was one time we were in uh, somewhere, 
and I saw him. He cursed out this dude, man. This dude came in the dressing room trying to be, you know, some people just get too familiar. For sure. You know, and they, you know, he, he talking to Jimmy. He was he was a keyboard player. Yeah. And, you know, talking to Jimmy like they were peers. You know, mm. he would say some stuff like, yeah, well, you know, Jimmy, one keyboard player to another and all this. Right, 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 yeah. And Jimmy <laughs> can't be went, doing that. You can't do that to Jimmy. Right? <laughs> and Jimmy went off. He ran this guy out of the room. I thought, I thought he was going to hit him. But he ran this dude out of the room. He said, mother, you're getting too familiar, man. Right, right, right. No, 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 don't do that. He ran him out of the room. But you can't do that. I've seen that happen a lot. People just get too familiar. Mm-hmm. Just because one of these legends or anybody, for that matter, is nice to you, that doesn't give you license to overstep I hear your you. boundaries. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. So, but uh, but Jimmy was he was he was a beautiful cat, man. And like I was going to say before, you know, when he's as long as he was had an audience, he was always you know putting always on, the show on yeah, always on. But in a one on one situation, he was a completely different person, man. And I've been lucky to have spent one on one time with a few of those guys. Like Freddie Hubbard was one that mm-hmm. I got to spend. Some one-on-one time with. I used to call him up and talk to him, and he, you know, because he he would feel good about that because he's he was. I caught him a couple of times when he was feeling down about not being able to play mm. the way that to the up to the level that he was used to playing because yeah. you know he he had had problems with his lip. So I would always call him up and I'd give him encouragement. I say, hey man, listen, if you never play another note again, it doesn't matter. You're Freddie Hubbard, right? But I gotten to be in situations with him uh, one-on-one. That was one night. I went to go see him at the... Uh, I sat in with him. He invited me to come by the Iridium and sit in with him. So I was like, whoa. Well, and I gotta tell you, man, it was scary. Because <laughs> even though Freddie had... That guy seemed to, like he could be scary. Well... Musically. See, Freddie was not playing the way that he was used to playing mm. at that time when I sat in with him. But standing on the bandstand next to him was scary because, first of all, you get one perspective on a guy or a lady or a musician yeah. when you see them on stage or when you're listening to their records. That's one perspective. Yeah. But now, it's kind of like going to the zoo <laughs> standing on the other side of the cage I where the bear you. is. <laughs> you see the bear and you know that the bear is a formidable creature. I hear you. Now, Imagine being on the other side, inside the cage with the bear. They look bigger. You could hear them breathing. You know that at any given moment, they can rip you a new one. They could tell you <laughs> apart. But that's the way it was standing on stage next to Freddie Hubbard. You know, he's standing there, and it looked like he had grown a couple of feet taller. I hear you. It's definitely a different experience being on. And, yeah. you know, I'm like, man, this guy, I'm thinking all about all those great records like uh, Ready for Freddie take uh, those uh, those tools like take it to the ozone yeah, all that yeah, yeah. the, the stuff that he did with Art Blake and the guy used to practice with Coltrane that's crazy and the stuff he did with Wes Montgomery when he was a, when he was a youngster yeah. and I'm, I'm like this guy even though he's not able to execute the he's way that he all, once yeah. did he's seen so much and he's still got the music in him he's still hearing Yeah. and he's looking at you the whole time you're playing and I'm like oh lord um, you, you just hope and pray that you don't you don't play anything that's stupid <laughs> I think you told me that you used to call him when the Lakers were on because you knew he would always huh? be. A, did you tell me that you used to call him when the Lakers were playing? Or no, something? no, no. I was. Gonna, I'm, I'm not a sports fan, so that, okay. would, be, that would be somebody else. I th- okay, yeah. Yeah, but he was. You know, he was a beautiful guy, and yes, he, he he invited me to play on his on one of his last recordings. Right. So I ended up doing that, and that was one of my. Um, that was an honor to be able to make music with Freddie Hubbard. That's cool. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you about solo guitar because I feel like you have such your own style of solo guitar. Did you consciously develop your own way of playing solo guitar? Or how did that come about, the way that you do, approach that? Um, I didn't consciously... You, did I consciously develop my own way of doing it? It just happened. Yeah. Know? Well, actually, nothing just happens. But you can only be who you are. I can't play like... I tried to play like Joe Pass, because he was... You know, he's, he, him and Johnny Smith, they really uh, set a certain standard for uh, playing solo guitar. But I can only be me. I hear you. You know, so I just, you know, I got inspiration from those guys. But the way I started to pay attention to uh, approaching the guitar, approaching the guitar from that point of view was, uh, there were a couple of guys who uh, who were inspirational for me. First guy was John Collins. I don't know if I ever mentioned him to you before. I don't know. Well, John Collins, he's gone now. He was born in 1913. And he uh, died, I think he died in 2001, 2002. But he was the last guitarist to play in Nat King Cole's band. Okay. 
Uh, he also played with Fletcher Henderson, and he played with uh, Art Tatum. Okay, that's crazy. I, he, I mean, this guy was heavy. <laughs> and the way that I got turned on to him was through Ray Brown. Mm. I was at a rehearsal with Ray Brown. This is back in 1990, when I first met Ray. Now, the way that went down, we were in New York. Uh, I was playing with Harry Connick at the time. And somehow or another, we were supposed to do some TV show. It was me, Ray Brown, Ned Gould, great tenor player. We were just talking about yeah. it. Ned Gould and a drummer named Shannon Powell, who uh, was the drummer. That's the guy who was friends with Michael Jackson, right? Yeah. yeah <laughs> Michael Jackson, yeah, yeah. It was Shannon Powell. He was the drummer in Harry Connors' band. A great drummer, by the way. Mm -hmm. Nobody drove that big band the way that Shannon drove it. And Harry's had some great drummers since then, but when it came to driving a big band, shit, Shannon Powell, forget about it. He was fantastic. Cool. Anyway, so um, Harry didn't show up for the rehearsal. <laughs> he ended up being like maybe three, four hours late. Okay. So that gave us time to spend time with Ray Brown. And he told so I'm going to get back to John Collins. Okay. But uh, Ray Brown, I mean, he was someone that I'd always wanted to meet and play with. Mm -hmm. And he told us so many stories, man. We just spent about uh, two, three hours with him just hanging out and playing tunes. And he told me a, 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 an interesting story about Charlie Parker, man. He said that uh, Bird... As great as he was as a, as he was as a jazz player, because he's given us so much beautiful music, mm -hmm. you know those songs and just his whole genius. He's a genius musician, but he said Bird liked country music. Bird like he would take some of the corniest tunes that a lot of musicians wouldn't touch mm -hmm. and just make music. And he talked about uh, they were somewhere one night at a jam session, and Charlie Parker. Uh, played this tune, My Melancholy Baby. You've heard that song. Yeah, yeah, da, 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 dee, da, 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 da. And he was talking about how Charlie Parker, who very rarely played long solos, but he said Bird really stretched out on this tune and just played. So and Ray Brown, and this gave me chills seeing him do this. He started, and I, because this was back in the 40s, like in the late 40s when they were when he was when he was talking yeah. about this experience that went down yeah and he was even um years later he remembered fragments of charlie parker's solo that night and he started singing wow. fragments of bird's <laughs> solo and i just got goosebumped man i'm like wow that's crazy and just seeing his face <laughs> light up when he was talking about it but okay back to john collins so um when he was leaving Harry finally got there, so Ray Brown was packing up his bass after we rehearsed. And so uh, I asked Ray, I said, hey, well, you know, you know how we all we get around people like that. We always want to get constructive feedback on our, of course. On our, on, yeah. on our plans. So I asked him if he was, if he'd heard anything that I should probably, that I should probably address. He said, yeah, kid, you can play. He said, you can play, but you got a lot to learn. You ever hear of John Collins? And I had heard of John, but I had never really listened yeah, to John. Yeah. I never really checked him out. I said, well, I, I, he, I said, the guitar player who played with Nat King Cole? He said, yeah. And then he said, well, not just Nat King Cole, but Art Tatum, Fletcher Henderson, and blah, 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 yeah, yeah. on and on. So Ray Brown wrote his number down. And I'm going to his exact words, I'm going to tell you what he, his exact words to me were. Next time you're in Los Angeles... You take your little young ass over there and go get some of that shit. <laughs> That's what he said. Yeah. So the next time um, I was out in Los Angeles with Harry, um, we had a couple of days off. So I called John. I called John Collins. And um, he was a little, uh, he was a crotchety old man. He was he was ornery. I agree. <laughs> but once we got to know each other, I saw the sweet side of him. But mm -hmm. that day on the, when I called him up, he was like, who are you? Who are you? <laughs> he answered the phone. You know, the phone rang, he answered the phone. What? That's what he answered the phone. <laughs> ah, <laughs> so I told him who I was and uh, that I uh, got this number f from Ray Brown. And uh, he was, at first, he was like, man. And then he, uh, I guess he must have heard the, disappoint the disappointment in my voice. So he came over, that old man, he was pushing 80 at the time, mm -hmm. came to my hotel. I was staying at the Beverly, at the, uh, at the Sofitel, the Hotel Sofitel up on Beverly Boulevard. Mm -hmm. 
in Los Angeles. So he came, picked me up, and uh, he was still a little apprehensive because in the car I'm trying to make small talk. And he didn't really have that much to say, but I said, oh, well, just be grateful that he came to pick you up. So right. that's something. He came to pick me up. So that's some kind of progress. So we go to his house. He said, well, take out your box. That's what the old time was called. Right, the right, yeah. said, take, take, take your box. I don't want to hear, I want to hear you. So at the time I started, I started improvising. Uh, I mean, the way I was thinking, the way I was thinking at the time, it was more like single lines and mm -hmm. I was a speed demon, you know. And I started to just improvise over the changes to a tune. I didn't, man, I don't think I even addressed the melody. Yeah. I started playing something like All the Things You Are or something. So I could hear him groaning. <laughs> like, like, you know, as, as if to say, another one of these kinds of cats. Another one of them kind of cats. <laughs> well, I've been there, just hear people like, oh, man. <laughs> so he said, well, let me see your box. So this old dude with these, he took my guitar and with these, these arthritic fingers started playing Lush Life. And it was one of the most mind-blowing, breathtaking, most beautiful things I'd ever heard. And it took me about maybe, it took me about maybe a couple of minutes to pick my jaw up off the floor. Yeah. And he dropped this on me. He said that, uh, he said, one of the things that disappoints him about a lot of the younger players is that everybody's so busy trying to be horn players. They yeah. want to play like a horn. He said, oh, that's great. That's all well and good. That's, yeah. a, that's a part of it. But the guitar is much more than that. Yes. Uh, it can function as a small orchestra, you know, if you look at it that way. Yeah. And he told me that, because uh, he, he was a World War I veteran who had been you know, all over the world, and he told me that he had seen, when he was over in Europe somewhere, he saw Segovia. He saw the great classical player, Andre mm. Segovia. You know that name. Yeah. And he told me that um, the thing that was so beautiful about watching Andre Segovia's play was how he mesmerized the audience with beauty, just the beauty that he got out of the instrument. And it wasn't a whole lot of pyrotechnics yeah. and all that stuff. But uh, the audience was so transfixed by the way that he extracted all of this beautiful, yeah, these beautiful things out of the guitar. And he talked about uh, other players in the jazz world who play uh, from that point of view, people like Joe Pass. Yeah. He loved Joe Pass. Mm -hmm. He loved Johnny Smith. He loved George Van Epps. Okay. You know that name? Yeah, but I'm not... Yeah, well -versed. No, no, but these 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 guys they 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 they, they played uh, from an orchestral point of view, and Jimmy Smith used to talk to me about that. You know, early on, he, yeah, he would he would talk to me about that. But um, John was the one who really uh, lit that fire under me. And That's then there was cool. another guy, man. Uh, you may or may not have heard of this, heard of this guy, but he used to teach down at the University of North Florida. This old timer named Jack Peterson. Okay. And I'm, he's still alive. He's pushing 90. He'll be, I think he'll be 89 in October. Cool. Uh, but he was one of those, he is one of those guys that uh, played that way. And he turned me, I used to go to his house, man. That was one time I was doing a gig down there with uh, Bucky Pizzarelli and down in Florida with Bucky Pizzarelli and Mondel Lowe. Heavy company. Yeah. <laughs> And after the gig was over, we all went by Jack Peterson's house that night. And there was another old timer there named Fred Sharp, who taught Jim Hall back in the day. Wow. This guy, whoo, he was something, man. Yeah, but so been around those guys. Yeah. And uh, Ron Carter, I have to, and I have, I have to, I have to keep, um, I keep, I, I can't forget about some of the lessons that I've gotten yeah. from him, because uh, he turned me on to a name uh, that I'd never heard before, Gene Bertoncini. Actually, yeah. I, I, had, I had heard of Gene before, but I never heard him play. And I was uh, hanging out with Mr. Carter one day, and he uh, told me to go see Gene. Gene was uh, playing at this place called La Madeline's. He had a weekly gig at this place down over, uh, over on, uh, near, right across the street from Manhattan Plaza, those apartments, mm -hmm. those apartments. And Gene used to play there at a one night engagement over there one night a week engagement over there per week one night i'm sorry you can edit that out <laughs> a, <laughs> a weekly engagement, yeah. a weekly engagement so i went to go see him and ron said well you know go just go check him out and because you're not going to get a whole lot of uh 
flashy, flashy stuff, stuff yeah. but you're going to get a lot of music. Mm -hmm. Just go check him out and just to see how he gets around the guitar. Yeah. And uh, I went to go see Gene, and I have not taken my eyes or ears off him since. Yeah. yeah. And then we got to play with him. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's right. That, yeah. that, 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 the, uh, that thing that they did for me a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That award thing. Back in 2018 when I got that award. Yeah, but uh, so that's how I got into solo guitar, man. And I listened to um, the guitar players who play that way, obviously, but I also listened to piano players. I've gotten a lot of things mm -hmm. from piano players like Hank Jones. Oh, my God. Yeah. Hank's solo piano is incredible. George Shearing's solo piano is incredible. Um, Tatum, of yeah. course. Yeah, so, and then um, um, orchestras. Just the way that they move harmony around, like John John Clayton, Alan, Alan Broadbent. Mm -hmm. I got to work with the, both of those people, uh, Johnny yeah. Mandel. Yeah, just uh, listen to their orchestrations and seeing, paying attention to how they move harmony around. Yeah, yeah, awesome, cool. Well, I don't want to take too much more of your time. No, okay. This has Let's been no, no, awesome. No. We can talk some more if you want to. Well, are you hungry? I'm getting there. We uh, got some food happening in the kitchen yeah, here. Marco, she's in there working her magic but i know that you you're starting to teach now so i just um was wondering aside from the stuff that people hear in music school about getting good at their instruments like what kind of advice would you have for younger people on how to be successful in music other than the obvious of learning tunes and getting your instrument together well that's definitely something that you have to do yes yeah. <laughs> but you know something else uh luke um, I was hanging out with a young guy not too long ago. N nice player, but he hasn't had much playing experience. Mm. You got to get out and play with people. Uh, and it's one thing to put your uh, videos up on social media, yeah, Facebook, or YouTube, but playing with people is a completely different thing. <laughs> this is social music. Playing yeah. music is a social experience yeah it's a social endeavor so you got to get out and play with people and i listen to a lot of these players i mean i look i watch some of the videos yeah that they put up on social media and i'm not putting anybody down right but a lot of them um i'm putting out some of those videos myself so uh, no but you play with <laughs> but you play with people though yeah i hear you but... a lot of these people i don't see them playing with people you i mean you're a different case because you got the experience of playing with people i hear you yeah but some of them i never see them i see the videos and it's good but I don't see them playing with people. Right, I never yeah. see them out. And I, I used to get out on a regular basis to you, check out people. You always got out and checked out people. You know, and... uh You'd be coming to my gigs. I hear them playing, and it's like, okay, it's good. But it's almost like, um, imagine a, a, a boxer. You know, you can be in the gym working out on That's a heavy a, band, yeah. And it looks good. That's yeah. it. I'm taking boxing, and I do look good when I'm by myself, It for looks sure. good. Yeah. You know, when you're, you know... <laughs> But the bag doesn't hit back. Exactly. So you got to go out and play with people so you can yeah. feel what the drummer is doing, feeling everybody breathing on yeah. stage, you know. And uh, We've all gotten hit back a few times on and, stage. And, and, and having sure. people react to what you're doing and then you being able to react and respond to what they're doing. Yeah. So you can't really do that in the practice room. Right. So, you know, you got to get out and play with people. Uh, other things like... Being on time. Mm -hmm. uh, you impressed that upon me. <laughs> yeah, being on time. Being on time. Uh, calling people back with this. Somebody calls you for a gig. Get back with them immediately. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to have to chase you around just to put some money in your damn pocket. You mm -hmm. got to call people back. Mm -hmm. And I've done. I've been in situations where I'm call. I've called people for gigs, and they, you know, they take their time getting back with you, and then then by the time they. They do call you back. You've already gotten somebody else, and they're like, "Oh man, no, no, no." Yeah. Call back. Yeah. I'm here to put money in your pocket. So yeah. if I'm trying to do that, then the least you can do is call me back. Yeah. yeah so all those little things, man. Uh, looking the part. Yeah. I remember one night I was uh, hanging out in Smoke, and uh, Lewis Hayes was in the club that night hanging out. You know, I love Lewis. He was Hayes. always looking cool. Too. He's always he he he, he looks so cool on yeah. the bandstand and off the bandstand. But we went to go see this band, and they played great. But they looked like some they like they had hoboed to their way to the gig. <laughs> and so I'm you know I'm looking at them. Lewis Hayes is looking at them, and he leans over to me. He said, "Malone, the audience should never be dressed sharper than the band." I hear you, and that's true, man. That you know, so how you look 
has how you look and how you carry yourself has bearing on how people perceive you, totally. how, they, how they deal with you. Yeah, you know, so all those little things are um, are important factors yeah. in you know in in in, 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 in being a, having a career in the music. Mm -hmm. And don't go in there, don't go into this business expecting any guarantees because there are no guarantees. Totally. And nobody owes you anything. Yeah. And don't become bitter. Try not to be bitter. I think one of the most exhausting things to encounter is a bitter musician Amen. who feels yeah. like somebody owes you something. Totally. And, you know, I, 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 which is one of the reasons why, another reason why you don't see me out as much. I mean, I still get out if there's somebody that I want to hear. Yeah. But there are a lot of musicians out there who are bitter, who, who, who are bitter and jealous. I hear you. It you can know, be. and it can be really exhausting, man. Yeah. You know, the gossip and all that. I, yeah. I just got no time for that. I'd rather stay here in my house. And, and you know, if there's somebody I want to see, yeah. I'll go do that. But for the most part, I'd rather, you know, stay yeah. here and just relax with my lady. I got a comfortable environment here. You got some guitars back here. Got some guitars and I got plenty of food. Yeah. So I'm okay, man. If you're ever just putting on a record, is there... One or two albums all time, any type of music that always do it for you. Oh, there are a couple. Yeah, man, the one that uh, the, that gets me going, man, that, uh, the dynamic duo, Wes Montgomery, Jimmy Smith. Yeah, Lord have mercy. That one, uh, first time, you know that record, first time, Duke Ellington and, and Count Basie. Mm -hmm. Great recording, man. Uh, Les McCann sings. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. That's a great too. record. Johnny O'Neill turned me onto that record. Long time ago. He does that, a lot of those there's tunes. There's a record yeah. tune next spring. Yeah. Uh, what's that other one he does? It's way past supper time. Yeah. You know that one? That's yeah. That's a great tune, man. <laughs> and I put on I put on any anything but Barry White. That record, uh, <laughs> Barry White sings for someone you love. You turned me on to that record for the first time. Sam Cooke live at the Copacabana. Mm-hmm. Ooh, that's a great record, boy. That's a good one. Yeah, so there's, there's, there are a few things that I like to put on that uh, I listen to for my own enjoyment around here. Yeah. yeah, Andrew Renfro wanted to know when the the Blind Blood Sausage full full records coming out. That's his favorite. So I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like blues. Yeah, yeah I love blues. That, 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 that's a funny character. <laughs> Who's yeah. your favorite blues guitar player? If you had to pick well, one or two, that's a hard one because there's so many good ones. Uh, I like Blind Gary Davis. The Re Re Reverend Reverend Gary Davis. Okay, I like him. You ever check out some of his stuff? Not really. Yeah, yeah he's he's great, man. Reverend Gary Davis, uh, Lonnie Johnson. Yeah, who also did some blues and uh, some of the first jazz records with Eddie Lang. Yeah, yeah, I listened to those. Uh, I listened to him. I listened to um, Albert King. Have you? Of course. Yeah. Come on, man. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I feel like a lot of guitar players uh, don't necessarily have that bag. No, uh -huh. I loved it. You know, we, we used to, we used to, when we would do gigs, I would always end the show with the blues. I right, dirty, yeah. raucous blues. I love it, man. Yeah. Yeah, because that's where I come from. And I appreciate jazz players. That's one of the things that I've always liked about Harold Mayburn. Mm. He was never too high and mighty to get down when I he came to playing the blues. <laughs> and when he played the blues, he really played the blues. Yeah. I heard Randy Weston do that one time, man. Mm -hmm. We were somewhere. And uh, he played this Barrel House. I just, I mean, it was killer, man. I liked him anyway, because he had, you ever, you ever get to see him play? No. Yeah, I got to play with him one time. He, his last gig in New York was at the um, at the Jazz Standard. He invited me to come by and sit in with him, because I would always go see him whenever he'd be playing anywhere. So he saw me one night uh, at the Standard. He, uh, he was playing there. He said, uh, Malone, you got your box? I said, no, man. He said, well, come by tomorrow night and bring your guitar. So I um, brought my guitar and I got to play high fly with the composer. Uh -huh. That was great, man. That's cool. Yeah, but see, you know, all those great players like that, all my favorite players, they have that element. Bags had it. Ray Brown had it. And those guys loved it. They genuinely loved the blues. Right. Yeah. So uh, there it is. Cool. I hear you. But there are some great, having said that, there are some really beautiful young players out here that I really like. Okay. Who are some that uh, well, come to mind? Uh, man, have you heard this single, Samara Joy? Summer of Joy? I have, yeah. Man, that young lady, she's got she's got the juice, man. Mm -hmm. I like her. Uh, I like her. She's got that old thing. You know what I, you know what I mean when I say that. That's, she's got yeah. that, 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 old, that old feeling. How do you get that? Are you just born with that, you think? Or? I don't know, man. I, I, that's, it's a mystery. Yeah. But she's got, she's, she's got the right stuff, man. Uh, I like Andrew Renfro. I like yeah. him. Uh, Dan Wilson on guitar. Mm-hmm. 
uh, Emmanuel Wilkins. Yeah. And both, man can play some sax, man. Yeah. So there are a few guys, man. Uh, David Wong, I mentioned him, but he ain't so young no more. He used to be young, but he's getting old now. He looks the same to me. Yeah, but, uh, but there's some really wonderful young players out here who really get it, man. Yeah. I know you're talking about that old thing, like, when you just go hear some of those older guys, like when I would go hear Jimmy Heath or George mm, Coleman. Yes, there's some people who... I don't that, know what that yeah, is, but I know yeah. what you're saying. There's something different there. Yeah, there's something different, yeah. But you got that. Well, I've been around some of those guys, man. So I've been lucky to to be to hang around them. We used to have a saying back in the country: you hang around the fireplace long enough, sooner or later some smut's gonna rub off on you. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to do. So I feel I'm I'm, I'm happy that some of the smut is rubbed off on me. <laughs> For sure. Mm -hmm. Well, well yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate you doing this, man. I thank you for all the great musical experiences we had. Mm -hmm. Thanks for letting me figure it out on the bandstand. Yeah, uh, so yeah, many well, times. That's what you, you know? do it, man. That's that, that's hey, trial and error, man. I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. You got any uh, final jokes or things you want to say to me? Uh, immortalize any comments? Yeah, that's a nice. I, I don't know, but I, I like your shirt. Though. Oh, that's thank a nice you. shirt. Think it'll come back in style one day. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. <you. laughs> there's right. your joke. <laughs> Thanks, Russell. Who's making love to your old lady <laughs> while you was out making love? You never heard that song? I don't know if I really know that song. a great bass line. Check that out sometime. <laughs> okay.